We want to welcome each and every one of you here this morning in this, as the body of Christ in this place who comes to worship our living Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're one of our guests today, it's great to have you here, and we pray that you already have received a warm welcome and that you sense that the presence of Christ is here as we've come for but one purpose, and that is to worship our living Lord Jesus Christ. Just two announcements. Um, the, the bulletin indicates that the elders will meet on Monday evening. That's incorrect. The elders will meet on Tuesday evening at the regular time, 7 o'clock. Also, Brian Vandervliet um, and four others were hopeful to be in Liberia at this time, but they got to Chicago. The flight from Brussels, from Chicago to Brussels, the plane had mechanical difficulty and they were delayed, realizing that they would then miss their flight from Brussels to Liberia, which only goes twice a week. And so they had to come home. So that's certainly disappointing. They're trying to rearrange their schedules, hopefully to find a different time now to go to Liberia. But you know how it is when you anticipate something and then it suddenly changes, it's difficult. So just lift them up in your prayers and pray that uh, that'll be worked out in the near future. The Lord calls us to worship from Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. May that be our desire this morning. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. That's what we're going to do in a moment here. We're going to sing in the shadow of God's wings. My soul clings to you, my right hand, your right hand. It upholds me. Praise the Lord that we can come to such a God who cares so deeply for us. Let's rise to sing, Lord, our Lord, how your glorious name.
great God who greets us this morning in his great name says to you, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father. Through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, and through the Holy Spirit, poured out at Pentecost. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Coming before the great name of our great God, we need to humble ourselves because when we sense his greatness, we realize our own, our own inability to be great, even though in our own mind we, we try to be. We do everything to puff ourselves up like a puff fish to show that we are big and that we are important. But our God is so great, and he calls us to humble ourselves before him and to confess our sins. O oh Lord, do not rebuke us in your anger or discipline us in your wrath, for we confess our iniquity and are troubled by our sin. In light of that, we're going to sing together, Out of the Depths I Cry, and let's make this our request, our prayer to the Lord this morning. And also the children, uh, the Tyler children and children in worship can be dismissed during the song. <laughs> God has heard our cry for mercy, and he accepts our prayers. Let's pray together. Father, how gracious and how good and how merciful you are that you would take away our sin. You would take our sin and your justice, your anger, and lay it upon your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, Lord, we receive that gift of salvation by faith alone. Nothing that we can do, nothing that we can bring to you, but you make it possible as a gift given to us. Thank you for your word that we now will open, 
illumine our hearts, take away any distraction from the burdens, the responsibilities that face us in this coming week, that we may focus on what you have to say to us, and that we may hear your voice. In the holy and blessed name of Jesus Christ, our living Savior and Lord. Amen. I want to encourage you to take out your Bibles, your smartphones, and your tablets. In this day and age, some of us carry those and uh, read the Bible on that. Just stick on that though, okay? <laughs> Psalm 2. Psalm 2. It's not by accident that the compiler of the Psalms put Psalm 1 and 2 at the very beginning. They were not the first Psalms written. But they put them, the pilot compiler put them there for a very special reason, as we're going to see, as an introduction to the rest of the Psalms. It, it's like many entrances of commercial buildings, uh, like including our church, there are two sets of doors that you come through. Psalm 1 is really the first set of doors, if you will, and, and it, it points to the fact that you and I personally have to look within our heart in terms of, are we children of the Lord? Are we walking in the godly way? Psalm 2 also does that, and that's a second set of doors in which it, it brings it into a bigger context in which we find ourselves as part of a larger body of people, part of a nation, if you will. And so Psalm 2 really addresses that corporate responsibility, that bigger responsibility that is there. Psalm 2 is one of the most evangelical and evangelistic psalms of, of the Psalter, although it doesn't sound that way initially. This is God's word to us this morning, Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger, terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the deeds of the decrees of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. Be Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, it's a harsh reality but a biblical truth that not everybody in the church is in the church. Not everybody in the church knows Christ. Not everybody who professes Christ possesses Christ. That's a harsh reality. But Jesus said it would be that way. The tares will grow up in the midst of the wheat. The good fish will be caught in the same net as the bad fish and must be separated. The sheep and the goats will be separated on the day of judgment. And the foolish bridegrooms waited for the same, the foolish virgins waited for the same bridegroom as the wise one who took the necessary precautions and necessary oil so that they would be ready when the time came. There's always that verse that Jesus says that causes us to pause. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many ways say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we, not, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? They were active, obviously. Then I will say to them, plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, 
you doers, you evil doers. The great divide has always been part of God's word to us. And 3,000 years ago, that was true, too, when the Psalms were being compiled. There was that desire by the compiler to put Psalm 1 and 2 at the very beginning as the doorway, the entrance into the household of the 148 rooms that followed. It was the idea that first you would come through Psalm 1 and 2 before you would enter the rest. Psalm 1 would say there's only two ways, the way of the righteous and the way of the ungodly. Those who are righteous will be blessed, and those who follow the way of the ungodly shall perish. So the Bible is a very honest book. And it's like a laser that says it's not man's environment that's the problem, it's man's heart. What is in his heart? Are you on the way of godliness? Or are you on another way? Have you been planted by the streams of living water? Psalm 1 is placed there so that Psalm 2 will follow right behind it. Psalm 2 is a warning. It's, it's, called, it's calling us to examine ourselves. It's calling us to look deep within our heart. And so as you look at Psalm 2, and I want to encourage you to keep your Bibles open because that's really necessary because I want to look at each of these verses. Psalm Two has four stances, and there are three verses in each one. So stanza one has one through three, and then stanza two, four through six, seven through nine, and ten through twelve. Psalm two comes with great urgency. These verses represent the entire human race. You, you'll notice that as you look closely, nations are in the plural and the peoples are in plural. The psalmist is taking all those who live apart from the Lord, apart from the coming of the Messiah, apart from his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. All of them are in defiance of him and his son. It depicts the total depravity of the human race, the corruption of the human heart. That's what we have to see in the first place. The revolt of mankind. The psalmist asks the question in the first stanza in terms of the revolt of mankind, why? Why is there this madness? Why is there this uproar? Why is this, there this rebellion against the Lord and against his anointed men? Why is there this plotting, this conspiracy, this conspiracy, this raging, this uproar? And they're not quiet about that. They're very focused, very determined, very public. We see that in every public place, wherever community life is lived. <coughs> Excuse me. We see that in the marketplace. We see that in the government. We see that in institutions of learning in higher educations of learning. There's this furious resistance against God, this worldwide conspiracy, this global plot against the Creator. Could there be anything more vain? Could there be anything more foolish than, than rebelling against the Lord God? The psalmist focus now on exactly what, what happens. The kings represents the nations, and the rulers are the peoples that are under those rulers. They are, con they are consolidating, the rebelling against the Lord. Is that not really the history of mankind? No matter what era of history you, you study, there's always that underlying flow, that underlying spirit of conspiracy. There are leaders who, are, who, who rise up and they see themselves as the only thing. They rule. They are in charge. You have Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, 
Caesar, Hitler, and many others of more recent times. And that history reaches its zenith when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is brought into Jerusalem, is flogged, is crucified, is nailed to a cross. It is a revolt against God Almighty. Verse 3, listen to what they say. Let us break their chains, they say. Let us throw off their fetters. They want to be free of any moral restrictions of God. They want nothing to do with God. They'll, they'll have none of it. The ideal life is living without God. No limits, no constraints. They want nothing to do with God's plan for marriage, for the family, for community life. And this is where the psalm begins. It diagnoses the problem. It's, it's not the environment. It's not other things out there, but it's what's within. Romans 1 says there is godlessness, a wickedness that suppresses the truth by their wickedness. The revolt of mankind. But the second stanza, stanza 2, verses 4 through 6, talks about the response of God. The response of God. And what God says is terrifying. God is sitting on his throne as the sovereign one who rules over all. <coughs> Psalm, 3, or Psalm 103 says, Lord, the Lord has established his throne in heavens and his kingdom rules over all. There's that conspiracy against the kingdom of God. They want to throw off everything that has godly faith or commitment attached to it. And how does God respond? Look at verse 4. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. This laughter is not the laughter of hilarity. This laughter is not the laughter that we hear in the soundtracks, in many of the movies and the television programs that we watch. No, this is the laughter of derision, of disdain, of ridicule and mockery towards an insanity of man thinking that he can stand up against the Almighty and that he can have his own way and there is no other but himself. As if man thinks he can stand up against the Lord God. As if he can change the course of history that has been predetermined by God himself. The Lord laughs at man who thinks he can overthrow government. And the second part, verse 4, says, the Lord scoffs at them. The Lord God, who is holy, revolts against everything and anything that is unholy. The Lord God mocks, he ridicules man's attempt to be completely independent. The other night, Mary and I were watching Iowa Public Television, and there was a program called Novus, which was a celebration of the Hubble telescope, which has been a phenomenal thing. Even though they sent the thing up and the mirrors were not ground correctly and it, it gave them nothing but blurred pictures, what I've been experiencing for about a month with, after cataract surgery without glasses, they finally found a way to correct it. And as a result, it's been bringing back incredible pictures. And they decided, how many stars are there? Boys and girls, have you ever wondered about that? How many stars are there? Well, from the pictures they sent back from the Hubble telescope, they, they discovered that there is about approximately, they say, 200 billion galaxies. Our galaxy, of course, is one, but 200 billion galaxies out there, and every galaxy has one million stars. That's incredible, isn't it? And then they often, you know, the, the, the question that's been plaguing ast astronauts and astronomers and physicists is how old is the Earth? How old, not, uh, how old is the universe? How old is the universe? Well, they discovered from the pictures coming back from, from Hubble Telescope that the Earth is 13.7 billion years. 13.7 billion years old since the creation. No, 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 not the creation. Since the Big Bang. Since the Big Bang. All these people, these scholars, have been looking at this, and it's 
13.7 years since somehow there was a big bang and out of all that we have evolved to where we are today. And the Lord God laughs. The heaven rumbles with that kind of insanity. There is black energy. That's now the, 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 the real question. Black energy. We cannot get our hands around where does it come from? How does it? What is it? It is just there. Could it be a creator God? Could it be something he made? No. It has to be something that we figure out. And the Lord scoffs. The end of June, if the Supreme Court determines that marriage is not only between a man and a woman, but also that marriage is equally, marriage is between two men or two women, then the Lord will laugh. The Lord will scoff. That man thinks that he can change what he has ordained in the beginning as something, as a keystone, as a permanent thing, as a building block of society and life itself. In contrast to all of this, to the laughter of the Lord, the Lord declares something. See it in verse 6? He says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill, my holy mountain. You see, the Lord God has entrusted the kingdom of this world to a higher king, to the creator king, to the redeemer king, to the king who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose up from the dead and ascended into heaven as the king of glory, he was given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's all been given to him. There is no authority apart from Jesus Christ. There is nothing that we can do apart that it is in relationship, in reflection of who Jesus Christ is. So God declares, and we must always remember this, and the psalmist in compiling the psalms want, before you go back into further into the other psalms, that our God has set his son. He has set his son on his throne. And that he is the king over all. Then we come to verse 3, or stanza 3, verses 7 through 9. And the conversation of God. And this, this is so unique. Now the voice changes from God speaking First of all, laughing and then speaking, then, then God, now to, now to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's as we are invited into heaven, into a, into a inter-trinitarial conversation between the members of the Godhead. Christ anointed speaks. He said, I will proclaim the decrees of the Lord. God has said to me, namely to Jesus, this anticipation of the one who was to come, the psalmist said it was to David, of course, but the line of David, to Jesus. God said to me, you are my son, today I have become your father. And this is the decree that God has established. It's the eternal purpose of his, of his world, of his cosmos. It is God's eternal plan to carry out human history in spite of the rising of the nations in the attempt of overthrowing God's rule in every part of it. For our God not only rules the nations, but he overrules the nations. And he's in control. Those nations that, that throw off the fetters and want nothing to do with God, he is speaking to them. And then verse 8, God himself speaks, God the Father. He says to the Son, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, all the nations have been given to Jesus Christ. And his authority, his reign is over all of them. Not only the nations, but also those billions and billions of galaxies. And these multi-million stars. So how many stars are there? Well, astronomers say, boys and girls, if you want to know how many stars there are, you put a number two and then 22 zeros behind it. That's how many stars there are, whatever that number is. He's over all that. His authority, 
He reigns over all. Is that our perspective, that we have a God who reigns in that way? Do we have that kind of a worldview? The very reason for our existence, the very reason we got up this morning was, was to exult and praise the Lord. The very reason you get up tomorrow morning and go to work is to do whatever you do in the gifts and abilities God has given you, in the place he's put you, to lift up the name of the Lord and to come under his authority and to realize that you are a servant. You are a steward of his life, given to you for his glory. Everything else you do has to come under the context, under the reality of that. And when it does, then you see everything has a new meaning and a new perspective. Because we know he's the one who reigns. And we want to give all glory and praise to him. Verse 9, God explains to us, what the Father wants the Son to do with the nations when they die in their sin. He says, you, referring to the Son, you will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Jesus, at the end of time, because the nations were rebellious, because the people refused to come under his authority and took authority unto themselves, thinking that they had all authority for themselves to do what they wanted, they will come under the judgment of not God, but of Jesus Christ. He will the one who will crush them. He will the one who will go down to hell and punish them. Because the Father said, you will break them. You will dash them to pieces like a piece of potter's earthenware pottery. You see, a day is coming. The psalmist wants us to understand before we go into study the rest of the psalms. The psalmist wants us to understand that the day of grace is going to come to an end. Then the anointed Son of God will come as the judge of the nations. But until that time, we have to understand that he is giving it over to the Son. John 5 says this. Will you read it with me? John 5. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So this psalm, you see, has an urgent message. It begins in a, in a terrifying way. But we must not apologize for that. So often, when it comes to God's anger and God's wrath and God's judgment, we, we like to just focus on God's love. And there's, we must do that. God's love is awesome. In this lifetime, we will never be able to comprehend the fullness of God's love. But as, as one writer put it, we've done that so much that we almost air-conditioned hell. So it's no problem. I mean, those people who don't want God in their life will be just as happy in hell because God won't be there. That's not what the scripture teaches. That's not what Jesus says. That's not what the Father says that Jesus will do at the end of time. No, in Revelation 19 we read, From his mouth came a sharp sword, and his mouth is the Son of God. And with it he struck down the nations. He ruled them with an iron rod, and he trotted the winepress of his fierce wrath of a mighty God. On his robe and thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes, that's our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the redeeming Savior. He's the saving Savior, but he's also the Savior coming in judgment, and there's a sense of urgency. Urgency throughout history that we understand that, says the psalmist, right from the very beginning of God's word to us. So the first part is very alarming. It's a sobering entrance into the psalms. The compilers didn't want, want to just take this psalm and, and stick it in the middle somewhere. They, they wanted to put it right there at the beginning as a doorway for the rest of the psalms. And so it's like the front porch. We must examine ourselves. We must never take this matter for granted. Just because we're born in a Christian home, just because we've been baptized, just because we profess faith, just because we've, we have church membership, 
Doesn't mean we've met all the requirements and therefore we're in. It's no problem. As a pastor, we pastors stand before congregations and, and it, it causes us to tremble sometimes because sometimes we can just assume everybody is saved and we don't have to worry about anybody. And on the day of judgment, wouldn't it be horrific? Just because people came to worship, they thought they were saved. That's all there was to it, just to show up. But it's not. And the psalmist wants to make that very clear to us. Because in the last stanza, there's that wonderful invitation of grace. The wonderful invitation of grace. We have to ask ourselves, is our faith, is our commitment heartfelt? Is it genuine? Or is it just for show? Is it just for Sunday? The last stanzas, verses 10 through 12, is that wonderful invitation of grace. It's because of the bad news, the good news is so glorious and so wonderful. If there weren't, if there weren't the bad news, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need the good news. But the good news is, is the fact that we desperately, all of us, need a Redeemer. We have seen the defiance of the nations, but now, in the midst of that rebellion, there's the offer of God's grace, that imitation, that God, the psalmist, through the psalmist, God through the psalmist gives to the nations. Verse 10, the speaker changes here, and now the psalmist speaks on behalf of God, on behalf of the Son of God, it's his, as his appointed mess, messenger. Verse 10 says, Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Unconverted kings of all the nations, you're put on notice. All the peoples that live under your rule in every nation, every island, every place, this is God speaking to you. Be warned. Be wise. Your future is at stake. It's like that commercial, this man gets a note from someone and says, your heart attack will take place today. The future is in front of us. We need to be warned. It's a very dark future if we do not repent and turn from their rebellious ways and their resisting God, and that's true for us too. Verse 11 says, Serve the Lord with fear. Worship the Lord with reverence. Make your heart when you come to worship, it's not just something that we do and get over with this in a morning, in an evening, on a Sunday, but it's something we do all week long, but especially here in the, in the context of God's people, where we hear his word, where we recalibrate our lives, where we walk in his way. Serve the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. It almost seems strange to put rejoice and trembling at the same, in the same sentence. But what the psalmist is saying there is that we humble ourselves before the Lord. We humble ourselves before him as the only one. In him is our only hope, the only way. You see why this here in the last stanza is, is the most evangelistic psalm, one of the most evangelistic psalms as, as, psalm, as verse 12 is that wonderful invitation of grace. The psalmist calls out for them to know God, to walk in his way. Verse 12 says, kiss the son. Show your love, show your affection, show your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Already here in the Psalms, in anticipation of the one of David's line, the son who would come, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the son who will bring us to the Father. It's the son who takes us out of the deadness of our sin and bring us into a living relationship with Almighty God. And why is that? Because the ends of the earth must come to realize. They must come to receive that free gift, lest, it says, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. The wrath of God will soon kindle. In fact, the wrath of God is already smoldering because of what's happening in his world and in his cosmos. And soon that wrath will be ignited at the appointed hour. So the invitation comes. There's still time. It's still the time of grace. If you don't know Jesus Christ and have a living relationship with him, 
Don't let another day go by because we don't know when that time will come for us to be leaving this earth or when he himself will come. And then you have that last line which is full of concern, of compassion, of hope. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Running to Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's like that high tower, that one song you sing. Running to the Lord Jesus Christ and finding in him our purpose, our meaning in life. Because he takes away our sin and he gives us life in relationship to him. And then we know that he is our Savior. And God is our Father. And we have everything to live for. And we have everything to train our children for and to nurture our children. We have everything to encourage each other in. And we have everything to look forward to. Because the best is yet to come. Will we be blessed on that day? That's the question. Have you taken refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or will you, will you be cursed on that day? Will it be a great day for you when he comes and you stand face to face with him? Or will it be a day of utter horror? It will be a day of utter horror for those who don't know Christ as Savior and Lord. That last line, read it with me again, will you? Did I put that in there? No. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Will you say that? Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Let's pray. Father God, we stand amazed at your word. We stand amazed at the compiler of the Psalms who put Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 there at the very beginning as the doorway to the rest of the Psalms. Lord, we know this Psalm comes with great urgency for the nations, but we ourselves are part of the nations. We pray, Father, that we may find refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he would be the one who would take away our sins and give us life eternal. Father, I pray that we may all know, and if there is any who are uncertain, Lord, would your Holy Spirit touch their hearts? For, Lord, so much depends on what we do with you, the Savior's come into the world. We live in a society who has pushed him aside. And, Lord, it's easy for us to do that, too, in all our busyness. It's so easy to worship our own success, our own welfare, our own lifestyle. Lord, that none of that is important, but this is of crucial importance. Call us to yourself. In the glorious and blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We're going to rise and sing in response to God's word this morning. To God be the glory. Notice in the refrain, we say, praise him, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. The earth is going to hear his voice, either in judgment or in great glory. And it is our desire as we praise him with great glory. Let's rise to sing, to God be the glory.
two announcements. In our prayers, we should remember uh, Dwayne Tinklenberg, who has a detached retina. I know that all too well. So he is uh, laid up for a while. Um, of course, he had a preaching schedule, so he had to cancel that. In fact, next Sunday, I'll be in Pipestone, which was where he was going to be. So just pray for Dwayne for patience for a detached retina. He had surgery on it, and it should be um, okay. Also, John Van Middendorp, Middendorp, which is Kevin's father, had a stroke in his home last night. He uh, was taken to the Omaha Hospital and now has uh, two blood clots. So um, be in prayer for John Middendorp. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are the awesome God. You have done great things and we lift up our voice to you because you are the one who is to be praised. Father, we come because all glory does belong to you. You have done great things and are doing great things. We praise you, Lord, being the creator God. Lord, if we could be as cheerful and as content as the birds as we hear them singing in the morning, just praising you, knowing that you will provide for them through another day and they have not need to worry. Lord, give us that desire. Lord, we're grateful for the rain that you have sent. We're, we're grateful, Lord, for the crops. We already see the corn and the rose. And we pray for the beans. Lord, in all this, may we just know that you are a sovereign God and that your authority is over all of that. We praise you again today because you are the Redeemer, God. Thank you for the redemption that you've given us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We're thankful, Lord, that you are the one who's redeemed us from our sin. And this is still a day of grace. We know that you are also a God of judgment. And so, Lord, while there's still time, may, may we share the good news whenever and ever we can so that others will know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We know that he suffered and we know that condemnation was laid upon him for our sins. And, Lord, we're concerned about others who don't know him. So would you touch them and provide for them? Oh, Lord God, we still live in a broken world. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the people in Nepal. We pray again, Lord, for, for Troy and Faith Birma. We pray, Lord, that you will just provide for them. We know, Lord, this third earthquake has shook them again, and more buildings have crumbled, and more death has taken place. Oh, God, would you somehow bring relief to that area so that those who have been devastated and hurt may be healed and that you'll give comfort to those. We praise you, Lord, for Liberia, for the fact that, that there is free of li Ebola, but we, we're praying for other nations where there's still the effects. We pray, Lord, for the team that was going to go there to, to do mission work and to encourage the church there. And, Lord, somehow, um, because of uh, the aircraft, it was not possible. We pray that you would make that possible for them. We pray, Lord, for those, per those areas in the world where there is drought. We pray for those areas where there's too much rain and floods. We pray for those areas, Lord, where tornadoes have devastated uh, homes and buildings and, and property. We pray, Father, that you would just touch them. We pray, Lord, for, for our community that has been touched so radically by the avian bird flu. We pray for those families, Lord, who have been uh, touched, whose livelihood is, is in jeopardy. We pray, Father, that... We as your people and the churches of our community may come together to not only pray for them, but also, Lord, to, to help them in, in this tr crisis. We pray, Father, that you would bless Haiti as they, as they are seeking a new government or a new le election takes place there. We pray, Father, that in your sovereignty that your will be accomplished there. And we pray, Father, for, for that as well. We pray, Lord, for, for John Middendorp. We pray, Lord, that you would extend his life and give him healing um, in this uh, tragedy that has taken place and this stroke that he's experienced. So we pray for his family, for Kevin, and for the rest of the family as well. We pray, too, Lord, for your healing touch for Melissa Punt and for Christy Vanderveen, for Marcy Cruz, Gord Blum, for Norm Snyder, that you would just give him a more energy and strength. Father, we pray for this time of the year. It's a great time of the year in the springtime, and we pray for our boys and girls and young people who are still in school. It's hard to study. It's hard to get those things done, and we pray that you will bless them as they complete the school year. Bless the graduations that will take place, and we pray that you'll provide for them too. 
We pray, Father, that you would uh, uh, bless the Sulan Unity Congregation with Pastor Gail. Bless Lebanon, the Christian Farm Church, and Pastor Corey Van Sloten there. Lord, in all of this, may your name be glorified and praised. Father, we love you, but you love us so much more. Will you provide for us and will you give us what we need so that we may know. And Lord, may your warning and your grace be extended to all of us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. In the blessed and glorious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. At this time, the Lord calls us to give of ourselves in thanksgiving to him for all the blessings that he provides for us day by day. God calls us to live for him as we enter a new week to serve him with greater joy and greater determination, more intentionality than even last week to give him the glory and the praise in our lives. This is our God for grateful living from the Psalms. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to them, nor worship them. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord, your God. O Lord, Open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! 
Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Honor your father and your mother. Remember not the sins of my youth and my blood. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. You shall not murder. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. You shall not commit adultery. You shall set an iniquity before for you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. You shall not steal. Have mercy on me, O God. Loud out my transgressions. You shall not give false witness or false testimony against your neighbor. Keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me through your law. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant, or his maidservant, or his ox, or his donkey, or his machinery, or his tractors, or his cars, or his pickups. Or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Turn your heart to your statues, and talk for selfish gain. Save me from your all trans transgressions. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. I will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. We respond by singing the blood of Jesus shed for me. Make this um, our, our desire as we go into a new week to serve him as his kingdom citizens. before we leave this morning and sing our last song. Um, Mina, Hoff, Mina Nyhoff um, fainted and she struck her head 
and uh, was taken by ambulance from the church in worship this morning and brought to the hospital, but she was conscious as she left. She gave a thumbs up and said she was good, but they just want to check her out. So just be in prayer for, for Mina in, in this situation. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ the Lord, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with each of you now and always. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.